Hello, and welcome to Stanford Med Live. I'm David Entwistle, President and CEO of Stanford Healthcare, and I'm glad that you could join us today. Over the last 11 months, healthcare systems across the country have been tested like no other time. It's also an all-consuming journey as we think about the work in our communities and what we've responded to meet the day-to-day -day challenge that in fact seem to change on a daily basis. From developing infection disease protocols to ramping up testing to telehealth services, to responding to surges in hospitalizations and now distributing the vaccine, the sheer complexity of the challenges that health systems have had to face and navigate is staggering at times. Against this backdrop, our mission to support the health of all patients and keep delivering high quality care continues with a great urgency. As we witness time and time again, whether it's COVID-19 or heart disease or diabetes, Black Americans and Latinx Americans and other underserved, underserved minorities bear the brunt of this illness in our country. And as we know, we can do better and must do better. In many ways, our healthcare systems are at a crossroads. There is simply no easy path forward. But at this juncture, I believe that there's a great reason for hope and optimism. There are clearly issues that must be addressed to build a stronger healthcare system, one that is ready for the next pandemic, if that occurs. We hope not, but one that also serves the needs for all of our patients and focuses not on just treating illness, but remaining healthy in a lifelong endeavor. As we found, a crisis can be a sweeping catalyst for change. And frankly, what I've discussed so far is exactly why I'm excited about today's conversation with our group. Joining me today are leaders from three preeminent health systems across the country, Johns Hopkins Medicine, UCLA Health, and Atrium Health. In confronting the pandemic, they have each demonstrated tremendous resourcefulness and innovation. I know you've spent a great deal of time reflecting on this moment as I have and this opportunity that presents to create a better, more equitable system in the years that follow this pandemic. Today, you're gonna to hear stories and experiences of responding to COVID-19 and we'll discuss lessons that are learned and can be applied as we go forward looking at other opportunities. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers First of all, we have Kevin Sowers, who is the president of John Hopkins Health System and the executive vice president of John Hopkins Medicine, based in Baltimore, Maryland. He is the second person in Hopkins history to actually hold both of these roles, where he oversees the health system's six hospitals and their strategic focus. Kevin came to Hopkins Medicine after 32 years at Duke University Health System, and the last eight of those he spent as the president and CEO. Now I will share, I have been great friends with Kevin for many years, despite the Duke connection and the, myself being a strong UNC advocate. So I have to say that Tar Heel loyalty runs deep, but uh, we're, we'll have to talk more about that later. I'm also pleased to introduce Johnny Spizo, who is president of UCLA Health and the CEO of UCLA Hospital System and the Associate Vice Chancellor of UCLA Health Sciences. She is a nationally recognized academic healthcare leader with more than 30 years of experience and oversees the operations of UCLA hospitals and clinics, as well as the health system's regional outreach strategy. Before coming to UCLA, Jenny spent 22 years at UC or UW Medicine in Seattle, Washington. Now we won't speak to how long she and I have known each other and worked together, but let's say it's been a while since we were around the table uh, as CEO, COOs at Vizian. So I appreciate Johnny, it's you being here with us today. Also with us is Gene Woods, who is the president and CEO of Atrium Health, a leading not-for-profit health system on the East Coast, serving patients across 42 hospitals and 1,500 care locations across North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and Georgia. During his tenure, Gene has been a champion for quality care and access. Atrium Health, in fact, was recently recognized by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services as the 2020 CMS Health Equity Award winner 
for its work in reducing disparities and advancing health equity. Now, I've also been honored to work with Jean for many years on the American Hospital Association Board. In fact, where Jean served as our American Hospital Association Board Chair. And so great role and great opportunity. Kevin, Janice, and Jean, thank you so much for joining us today for what I know will be a thought-provoking discussion. So let's jump right in. As national health system leaders, each of you have played a critical role in the pandemic response in your organizations. So I'd like to start our session today by inviting each of you to reflect on that journey and sharing with us what have been the most important lessons that you've learned this past year? And also, what gives you hope for the future? Kevin, why don't we get started with you? You know, David, first of all, I want to say thank you um, uh, for having me with you today. And, and it's a pleasure. But uh, I, I did wear my Duke blue today. So um, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but, uh, you know, what What are some of the most important lessons? I, I wouldn't say that this is new for me because as a nurse, I have known this and as executive, I've known it for years, but it, it was reinforced for me during this pandemic. And that is number one, people matter. And number two, science matters. Uh, because we can't respond to this without our people. Um, and the reason if there ever was a time in this country when science really matters, it is now. And so that has been reinforced uh, for me and the importance of being a part of an academic enterprise that supports the, the, the tripartite mission. Um, where I find hope is uh, with the vaccine and the advancements that are being made in science uh, that actually have us learn more about uh, this virus and even the mutations of the virus uh, as, as we learn to respond better to that. And so um, that's where I find hope today. Janice. Well, thank you, David, and thank you, Stanford Medicine, um, for having us. Um, in addition to the great points that Kevin made, I would say that really reflecting on this <clears throat> journey the past year, are the three most important lessons, which I feel were key to our success in managing the, this pandemic, included really the recognition of the value of all the great work that we've done as health systems over the years in planning and investing in emergency preparedness and investments that are key to our emerging infectious disease infrastructure. Having that to fall back on allowed us to rapidly respond to the pandemic. In addition, I would say the advances that we've made in high census and capacity management and the extraordinary work and resilience of our healthcare teams in responding as needed. And then third, you know, really echoing the value of being part of an academic health system and looking at not only the clinical care, but the research and discovery that we have at our fingertips. The advances that that allowed us in not only information technology, but innovation and the ability to rapidly deploy tools, new testing technologies to quickly change care delivery to optimize both patient and staff safety and improve communication really helped us get through. The positive aspect, and again, I think there have been many silver linings to this, but certainly the rapid development of these safe and effective vaccines. I think that sent a message across the globe how important investments in research are. Having the ability to see the value of that research enterprise rapidly translate bench to bedside interventions has been key. It's not only been in the vaccines, it's been in the development of better treatments for patients with COVID, monoclonal antibody therapy, rapid advances in testing technology. All of that gives me hope for the future. What still keeps me up at night is that ability to manage some of the excessive surges with shortages of healthcare workers and also many other types of patients that need our care, particularly at tertiary and quaternary care medical centers. That as well as the vaccine shortage that's right front and center at this time, I think are some of the biggest issues we have yet to solve. Thank you, Janice. Jean. Well, again, thank you for having having us, uh, David. And it's great to be here with with esteemed colleagues from organizations and health systems that I that I have a lot of respect for. Um, 
you know, the one thing that comes to mind in terms of important lessons, uh, my sons are engineers. And so we talk a lot about Einstein and Einstein, as we know, said uh, time is relative. And there's there's a cartoon some of us may have seen instead of a calendar Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's day, 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 day. And so I, I'm, I know that time is relative, but another way that's relative actually is in speed to execution. You know, during this pandemic, uh, one of the important lessons is, is the decisions that sometimes would take us weeks, months and years sometimes to make. We've, we've done them on 12 hour cycles or it's sometimes even shorter. Uh, this past weekend, we did a vaccination event at Bank of America St Stadium here in Charlotte, uh, home of the Panthers. And we worked together with our business partners, Honeywell, who helped automate it. But we we vaccinated about 20,000 um, uh, people from the community. Uh, we had shots in arms every 4.5 seconds. And we actually planned that about a week. And so in, in the past, that would take us months and months to try to figure it out. And, and so the speed to execution is, a, is an important lesson uh, that we've learned. Um, what keeps me up at night right now is, is really, and it's sort of been highlighted, is just how politically divided we are as a country. And that's that's crossed over into public health. You know, when masking becomes a political issue, you know that uh, and, and instead of the, the science, you, you know, we're, we're it, it's a troubling sign. Um, and, and I agree with, with what Kevin said is, you know, let let science drive this recovery, not the politics. Um, and because this politics has crossed over into a lot of different sectors. And, and I think it's something that does keep me up at night. The, the one thing though, I, I find that I'm hopeful, you know, I have 70,000 employees, we call them teammates. And they come from all walks of life, rural, urban, all kinds of ethnicities, races. And the way that we've unified together this past uh, year around our, our mission of providing health, hope, and healing for all is something that I think what I get I get energized and I get hopeful because if we could do that within the confines of our organization, we can, certainly can model that for our communities. And, and, that, and that does give me hope. Gene, thank you. And I, I appreciate all of your comments. I think, you know, as we think through uh, some of the challenges that we face, certainly over the last year uh, with this pandemic, and I don't want to mitigate, I know we're still dealing with a lot of the challenges today. Uh, we were having the opportunity just to talk before we get on. And I know that in our own facilities, there's still a significant amount of patients that actually have COVID still that we're working with. And that opportunity with the vaccine produces that hope. Uh, in many cases, it's so neat. I assume probably there at the Panther Stadium, there was a lot of excited folks there that were getting the vaccine. Thinking about that, and uh, we've mentioned some of the politics that are going on now, but certainly President Biden is in office and through a number of executive orders that are being laid out right now, actually looking to increase our opportunity to better care for patients around the country. What would you like to see that's coming out of his administration that actually could provide some hope as we think through some of the things that are going on? What would be the most beneficial or influential to us? This is, uh, I think I'll start out. I think, you know, key in this next hundred days is really improving the vaccine distribution plan and a lot better coordination between federal and state government, between state and county government. Even you know, here in our state of California with so many people yet to be vaccinated, here in Los Angeles County with 10 million people, um, the supply and demand really hasn't um, matched. And we have a lot of anxious patients. We have a lot of anxious community members. So I'm really looking forward to some better communication. David, I would, I would echo that. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm concerned about is a, a more systematic approach to understanding uh, the supply versus demand. So if I look at where we are, because I, I have to monitor, and as Gene does, we have a hospital in Florida, one in DC, and so, and then the rest of the hospitals here in Maryland. Uh, so you have to understand what each jurisdiction is doing. And then even within Maryland, every county is doing something different. And so trying to keep up as a healthcare provider to something that is not a systemic, uh, systematic approach becomes very complex and understanding the, the rules of engagement. And my other concern is, is because there isn't a systematic plan from the federal level to the state level to the county level, one of the things I'm seeing is healthcare providers are being put in the middle when um, people are saying we're opening up to 65 and older. And, uh, you know, in, in the state of Maryland, that's over a million people. The state is only getting 76,000 doses a week. So if you start to think of how long it's going to take to vaccinate at that rate, but what's happening is the public thinks that they should be able to just call us and get the vaccine. And 
how do we deliver that equitably um, when there is a, a scarce resource and how do we assure that um, people are appropriately being vaccinated. And so we've created a lottery system uh, just to assure that that we are providing everyone the opportunity that wants the vaccine, but trying to be equitable in how we deliver it. Yeah. Yeah, I certainly would echo the uh, the vaccine distribution. You know, we are in a digital age and we're still sort of, uh, if you hear the stories of how people are trying to access and get scheduled, it's, it's back 20 years ago. So I think we can significantly up our game there. But I would add three things to it. One is, um, you know, with millions working from home, we've seen the, the technological inequalities and the digital divide. I mean, right now we've got 30% of students that are uh, in public schools or 16 million that don't have access to the internet or a, a device where they can connect. And that's not only an educational thing, is obviously is how we can access these families and vulnerable communities, rural and urban poor with, with, with the telehealth. So I'd like to see a big audacious goal, maybe connect America 2021 so that we can broad, use broadband and, and universal connectivity and be, have that be a national goal. So that's, that's one thing I'd like to see. The second is just it was alluded to significant investment in research. You know, President Biden led this uh, this cancer uh, moonshot campaign, and and what it did, I think, it galvanized really the academic uh, uh, community with with the business community, with government scientists to actually solve a, a, a problem. Uh, we saw how that combination, that partnership, helped with the vaccines. So how do we invest in research, and what is the next thing or the next two or three things that as a country we can we can we can really solve for like we're, we're, we're working on on the vaccine. And the third thing I would say is we've seen uh, the impact of a, a shortage in, in clinical workforce uh, during this COVID uh, time, you know, and Congress did fund an additional thousand uh, graduate medical education slots in the omnibus bill uh, uh, this past December. But we really, I think, if you think about uh, in in a couple of decades, the uh, the shortage is going to be up to 150,000 physicians. We really need to now invest in training this next generation, and then also making sure that we're reaching into uh, minority communities to give them a path. Uh, in, in terms of medical education. So our physicians really reflect the communities uh, that we're serving. I appreciate your comments on that. And I think, you know, one of the challenges certainly is thinking around the vaccine. And I love uh, the thoughts of saying, how do we become more connected? I can tell you, just speaking uh, with John East and I here in the state of California with 58 counties and, you know, recently making some changes in the way the vaccine will be distributed. Uh, is going to be a bit more challenging, especially if we can't bring that IT infrastructure, Gene, as you talked about, to play, to, again, connect back with the many individual records that we as health systems have to be able to keep track of that. You know, thinking about telehealth, I can tell you at our organization, certainly, telehealth became an amazing uh, piece of technology. In fact, uh, I don't know if you were like us, but it maybe have been a little reluctance on the part of some of our providers at adopting telehealth. Uh, and that immediately changed, uh, a catalyst for change, in fact, when we uh, saw the pandemic increase. Uh, I think we went from about 2% of our visits uh, uh, annually being done via telehealth to over a period of time, almost 70 plus percentage of those visits. And so rapidly changed. So I'm curious, I'd love for you to each talk a bit about how has telehealth changed for you but also, you know, talk about what are the limits of what we can accomplish on video? And then how are you thinking as your own organizations about what is that role of telehealth? And is there a way to more hardwire that, so to speak, into our organizations as a care pathway as we go forward? I can start, David. So I agree with you. Uh, what happened for us at Hopkins uh, is prior to this, uh, we were uh, only doing about a couple hundred telemedicine visits uh, a day. Um, and overnight, we went from a couple hundred to 6,000. Uh, and so clearly, uh, we learned a lot during that period of time. Uh, but I would highlight something that Jean said. Uh, we have to be reminded that if we are going to talk about health equity, not all of our patients have Wi-Fi at home. Not all of our patients have an iPad or a computer or an iPhone. So uh, I don't think it's going to be at our current state in this nation, the uh, one solution or the, the magic bullet. It, it does work for a segment of our population. Um, I would also say that the other thing that we learned about this is 
how do you develop the criteria for what who gets a telemedicine visit versus who needs to be in person? Because, you know, our dermatology folks said that, you know, in terms of really the physical exam, it was much harder sometimes to see uh, what they needed to see but, and would be more important to see in person. Um, uh, some of our psychiatrists told us to do the intake. Um, it's more important to be in person uh, than, than uh, doing the initial intake. Uh, so I, I really do believe that we have to come up with clinical criteria on how we're going to use it. Third piece, and then I'll stop, is really how do we build this into the provider's workflow? Uh, because uh, are they going to have it in the midst of their clinic, uh, or are they just going to have a telemedicine clinic that day? Um, and how do we provide us the, the right privacy during the telemedicine visits uh, in, in the workplaces that we have? Because our our, if you think about it, our clinics were never designed uh, for quote unquote uh, uh, telemedicine visits. And so it makes you re really rethink workflow, workspace. And so I think there's a lot of, uh, that we need to do to, to continue to advance telemedicine. Yeah, I agree. We had a similar experience at UCLA Health where we went from doing less than a thousand you know, a week to almost 20,000 a week very rapidly throughout our large clinic system of about 200 clinics throughout Southern California. Um, as Kevin mentioned though, that did work for a segment of our population, those that have the resources and tools. Um, it didn't work for a lot of our underserved patient populations. So with those groups, we really had to look at using our mobile outreach vans. We had to look at using our, some of our street medicine programs to really address some of the disparate care needs. I will say though, the patient satisfaction from using telehealth um, was really remarkable. Um, and I think it particularly allowed patients to feel comfortable connecting with their healthcare providers. One of the things that happened in California because very early on we did the strict stay at home orders we were seeing patients not coming in or not reaching out when they needed to. So it allowed us to really reach out, particularly for some of our chronically ill patient populations and connect with them. We do believe telehealth is here to stay for a certain segment of our population that is comfortable using it. And one of the other advantages we've seen now is that it's really allowed us to increase our capacity overall without putting bricks and mortar around clinics. So we actually have seen our visits overall increase by about 10 to 20% and allows more capacity to see those in person who need it. I would echo uh, what was said. Uh, the thing here, um, actually, uh, Atrium made an investment in telehealth about a decade ago, and so it, well, and it was physician-led, uh, technology-enabled. But I think sometimes in the past we've done it the, the the opposite way. We've bought the technology, and the clinicians say, "Well, what about us?" So really, when COVID hit, we were actually the physicians were all in and from the very beginning. And I think we've surprised ourselves with what it could do that we thought were previ previous limitations. Um, when we've all dealt with these capacity issues at our hospital and we launched our Atrium um, Health Hospital at Home, and we saw about 50,000 people in their homes with COVID. Now think about that. And so with monitoring and checking in and telehealth infused into people's living rooms and bedrooms, and we were even able to administer remdesivir at, at home. We have a, a medics that actually could go in homes as well. So, you know, what we realized, even though we were we were we've been at this for for the better part of a decade, we've had some self-limiting beliefs in in terms of what it could do, how far it could go. So now, uh, you know, those are fifty thousand patients that otherwise would have been hospitalized. And so, as we do our designing of new buildings and things of that nature, we're really taking that into account. And it's a great way to offload, you know, capacity from bricks and mortar. A lot of people would rather be at home anyways. So I think, um, and 30% of the people that we saw at home actually were Latinx, um, which was, which was, we really focused on those communities. Um, and, uh, and so we, we really see that we've only scratched the surface of telehealth. Um, and we certainly aren't going to go back to the way care was delivered before. That's all fantastic. I mean, I think about what our ability is to, you know, we traditionally think as hospital beds or clinic visits, but to think that actually there's actually a new mechanism for actually delivering care, then in some cases will be more adept. But even as you said, Kevin, though, not everyone has it available. So we've got to make sure that we're balancing what that piece is. 
you know, talk a little bit more about innovation. I love some of the thoughts that you've had because I think some of the innovative approach that you've done. And, you know, you think about even our own country, we literally went from genetically sequencing this unique novel coronavirus into what was now a vaccine that we're rolling out. Now, we all wish we had more of the vaccine to administer, but share a little bit about how has this sparked innovation in your own organizations? Has it been a, a driver for some of the things that you've seen and some of that interest level across your organizations? Yes, David, I think this has been such a tremendous catalyst for innovation. And what we've seen is not only innovation in our medical space at the university, but also in engineering, in public health. We've had groups come together in our UCLA biodesign modeled very similar to the Stanford biodesign program, where throughout this pandemic, groups were collaborating, we had the ability to provide funding, and we were able to really do everything from, you know, 3D printing of PPE to drive through testing station models, to really looking at any other types of therapeutics or equipment that could be used to really support the care and treatment in the pandemic. And it just fostered such a great spirit of collaboration. We had medical students, engineering students, public health students, nursing students, all rallying and working together. And I think that camaraderie is something that will really last in the future as we face and tackle a lot of different types of issues in healthcare. I might add uh, a similar experience. I think, you know, a lot of times we, we think about medical innovations in terms of vaccines, but what, what I've seen in a similar way, a lot of innovations around how we deliver that care um, and and just, in, you know, it's telehealth, but it's also mobile health and what we can put on a van uh, or, uh, to go into a vulnerable community, a rural community. We, we currently, for example, uh, d designed, I think one of the first, um, uh, we call them lung buses. We put a CT scanner on this Winnebago and we go out to rural communities and we've discovered a lot of uh, uh, precancerous uh, 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 lung tumors, if you will, or, or uh, and, and we're able to, to catch them early. So I think what what this has fueled is this this uh, innovation in terms of of how we deliver care. Uh, we talked about telehealth, but there's a whole bunch of other areas that we've explored. And, and I think the one thing that Te Teco was was said is uh, I, I think innovation occurs in the white spaces of an organization and and in terms of not these hierarchical lines and we've had a lot of people tell me that hey i, I didn't know this person in another department but we got together on a zoom call and we solved for x so this connectivity and this ecosystem where people uh have bumped into each other and worked together in non-traditional ways i think in of itself has spurred this this innovation around around delivery to tag on to that, David, you know, uh, to what Jean said and what Janice said, uh, you know, when we talk about innovation, uh, and I know a lot of people are talking about the warp speed that we went through to get to the vaccine, but uh, innovation I considered much more broadly uh, in terms of what I've seen happen from this. Uh, you know, here at Johns Hopkins, we have now close to 300 research studies that are just committed to, to understanding COVID, uh, both from a basic science perspective to the bedside perspective. And so um, I'm really proud of our researchers stepping forward and, and really leading the way in many of those studies. But I, I would also say that as a health system, uh, we more quickly integrated uh, our, our, our systems. Uh, it, it forced you to integrate uh, your systems in a way that would have taken us years uh, if, if this pandemic had not happened. Uh, I would also say when I think about innovation, I think of the innovation of us just standing up in our pathology lab very early on in the pandemic, the ability to do the test. Uh, when most, and, and it reinforces the importance of the academic medical center because our community hospitals did not have the resources uh, to do that. I would also say that when I think about now what we're doing around genome sequencing and how quickly we st stood that up to understand how much of the mutated viruses in our community and how we're going to respond to that, 
Um, once again, that's another point that I would go back to what I originally said. Science really does matter, and the tripart mission really does matter, um, and it reinforces for me how quickly people have positioned themselves to, 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 to allow science to lead through this. And so um, I, I've been very proud of the work we've done here at Hopkins in really committing to, to the science, which is the truth. Um, and that, that has been kind of our mantra throughout this is uh, science does matter and we'll only talk about the truth, uh, which is uh, based upon the research that we're doing. Yeah. David, there's, there's one thing maybe just to uh, add, you know, the, the other part of that, because it spurs in terms of the role academic health systems have played and can play, you know, the, the other innovation is just when we did a uh, COVID study on uh, uh, daily patients symptoms and enrolled them in a large database. And we enrolled about 20,000 patients uh, very, very quickly virtually. You know, a lot of times we used to do that differently, but I think the innovation in terms of how we just expand research and also that helps obviously minority communities as well. Sometimes it's hard to get. So I think the innovation in how we as academic systems enroll people in trials has also been, uh, has been changed how we, in terms of how we think about that. You know, I love that you brought that up, uh, Gene. In fact, you know, we've actually seen some of our clinical trials enrollment actually increase, you know, for some of the things that we've actually been working on and wanting to do. Gene, you touched on something that I'd love to just explore with the group because, you know, certainly the pandemic has exposed, I think, some deep and what have been around the country, deep entrenched health inequities uh, among some of our populations. And um, I will tell you, you know, even at Stanford, as we looked at rolling out the test uh, for COVID and, you know, how we were doing that, you know, even having drive throughs realizing that not everybody has a car or that the locations that we were in weren't the right places to make sure you're capturing individuals in all uh, different socioeconomic areas. I'd love to learn from your own organizations, what have you done as healthcare providers to really look at those opportunities to mitigate some of those and those, uh, some of the, even the social differences that go into that? Well, I can start, you know, I think, um, you know, Los Angeles is um, such a city of healthcare disparities, and it is so diverse that this pandemic really impacted every aspect of people's lives. Um, if you just start out with the schools, uh, with the stay at home order, right, the Los Angeles Unified School District, that meant 700,000 children were staying home the majority of those children are on free and reduced breakfast and lunch. So how do we begin to even feed children at home that need nourishment? So it was a lot of work. And I just think, you know, great work by our city and county in really setting up food mechanisms so people could come in and pick up those meals and serving hundreds of millions of meals through this pandemic. A lot of also partnership, one of the things we did um, through our UCLA Health Sound Body, Sound Mind program, which provides fitness, education, and nutrition in 120 of the LA Unified Schools, we did drive-throughs um, at our warehouses where we set up fitness kits, learning kits, and did grocery and food bags for students and their families to come through. As you mentioned, not everyone has a car to come through. So we also partnered with Uber and did some deliveries as well. But it really made us look, I think, at every aspect. Um, not only were there healthcare needs, there were basic food, nutrition, and shelter needs that this caused. Additionally, you know, as the virus began to spread in the community, looking at how many multi-generational households we have living together, how do we really provide additional shelter space for people to isolate from others in their family. So a lot of work in planning with the city and the county on hotels, respites, really places where we could um, work to shelter people um, in place. So I think this aspect of it, you know, was a little overwhelming at a city and a county the size of ours, but I think we did learn some really good models that will be able to be implemented in the future. I guess I would add, you know, obviously to the question, 
we've seen the intersection of this global pandemic and the and the and the racial inequities that that have existed for a long time, and it's laid bare these the disparities that exist in, in neighborhoods adjacent to one another. Uh, and I think when I think about the 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 same day that George Floyd died, so many people was was killed. So many people died from healthcare disparities on that very same day. Um, and you know, there's a American Journal of Public Health uh, highlighted that almost 900,000 Americans die every day due to factors such as racial segregation, individual and area level poverty, income inequality. It just wasn't on television. And, and, and if you look at that, that's 2,500 people dying daily because of these structural inequities. And, um, you know, so we've we've uh, leaned in heavily in terms of the social determinants of health. We've got a $10 million uh, contribution together with a $200 million contribution throughout this area to really help with affordable housing. Uh, likewise, we, we've, we've helped with uh, kids. We fed 10,000 kids for free um, just because we knew that they didn't know where they were going to get their next meal because they weren't in school. Um, we've really beefed up our ability to hotspot neighborhoods. So uh, in, in, in April, we were finding out, I knew that there were six zip codes that had significant disparities in testing. So we did put uh, testing capabilities on our, our mobile vans. We went into those neighborhoods, we worked with the churches and we eliminated the disparities in a very short period of time. And we had our own uh, lab testing, COVID testing capabilities in house. So we were able to do rapid turnaround. So I think that it's important uh, more than ever uh, to really make sure that this is not an episodic response. I think uh, the question for health systems and, and for, for other partners is, you know, are we gonna use the power of our, of our institutions, of our talent, of our resources uh, to really fight this structural inequity at its roots and make sure that five years, 10 years from now, we're still engaged in solving for this. And, and it is, it's another sort of uh, going back to what we would uh, maybe have the new administration put on, on their agenda, what does a moonshot look like for eliminating healthcare disparities? What would that look like? And what would all what would everybody in this country need to do to make that a reality? So I think, um, uh, you know, you, you paraphrase Martin Luther King, we have a fierce urgency of now, but I think it's important to also think about what we do today and, and what's sustainable five and 10 and 15 years down the road. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, uh, one of the lessons I think we need to learn and, and to talk about is while we talk about healthcare inequities, healthcare inequities are driven by systemic and structural racism. Um, and, and so it's not just that we have to deal with uh, the issues of health inequities. We really do have to get out in front of the issues that are, are still existing in this country around stru structural and systemic racism. And so uh, I think all of our organizations need to commit to that. Um, I want to start, though, in terms of healthcare inequities, talking about education, because uh, even if, as I look at our own workforce, and you know, healthcare workers were the first uh, to to be vaccinated, we saw a lower uptake in our underrepresented minority uh, healthcare workers. Uh, we did a survey saying, "What would make you take the vaccine?" Uh, uh, and they said, "Seeing other people that look like me um, uh, telling me why they took the vaccine." So we've done a video of our employees talking to employees. Employees to, to explain why they took the vaccine and how they made the decision. Uh, and, and also we have outreach to African American pastors um, so that we can begin education in the churches. We've also uh, partnered with our priests uh, for the Latinx population uh, because we're also seeing a slower uptick in the underrepresented minorities within our communities. So uh, the first element is really around uh, how do we educate people about uh, the risk benefits of the vaccine or uh, getting COVID. Uh, and then uh, we also, I'm proud of our folks, uh, we actually partnered with our homeless shelters here in town and have gone in and done multiple testing events to try to keep our homeless shelters uh, safe uh, for the people who need that resource. We also have partnered with hotels and the University of Maryland and Hopkins partnered together uh, for vulnerable populations uh, so that they could be quarantined safely. We've delivered 4.6 million meals uh, to our residents. And by the way, also some of our lower paid employees because we realized for some of our lower paid employees that hunger and getting food on the table was an issue for them also. So I'm proud of the work we've done there. And then last but not least, uh, to Jean's point and to Janice's point, 
we have strike teams uh, that are going into senior housing units and uh, in the district in Baltimore City, and we're actually vaccinating and we're going to them, uh, especially because they are vulnerable populations that would never be able to get to a vaccination site. So I really think that uh, the partnership with others in the community and a, a mission of public health has been reinforced during this crisis. What I love that you've all shared is you think about it, you know, we oftentimes as healthcare systems are thought of as, you know, the community resource uh, for what's needed in the community for healthcare needs. What you've all shown, though, is that, in fact, with the right partnerships and proactively reaching out to whether those are the county resources, whether those are our local church resources, whether those are the individual food banks and industries that, are, quite frankly, are in this space already, that we could be a powerful convening force and uh, uh, just amazing uh, shout out for all the great work that's being done there. You know, as we think and maybe shifting gears a little bit to actually looking a little bit more internally, um, we know prior to this pandemic and this pandemic has certainly not helped. Um, as you think about the healthcare industry is struggling from what we're already contending with before this has occurred with the pandemic is burnout of our own teams, of our physicians and providers and individuals. What have your organizations done to confront some of the provider burnout that's occurred or was occurring and then probably is being exacerbated now? Love your thoughts on that. Well, I think that's been a huge issue for us, um, particularly as we weathered what was really two surges, right? So um, we started early in the first surge with looking at all types of wellness amenities that we could provide our staff. I'll also say, you know, a special thank you to the LA business community who really supported us, our LA sports teams in really giving us so many amenities to really improve staff well-being. We served about 50,000 meals to our staff during the first phase of the pandemic. What we began to see though during that second phase is that people were just tired. We had to have people working extra. We were really not able to get the numbers of travel nurses or other support staff we needed. So we relied on our own staff a lot for extra staffing. And the resiliency during that period um, that we've just come through, I think was a lot tougher than the first phase. I think one of the things that happened is um, when we saw during the first phase, we got through that, our patient volume had actually returned to really just a handful of patients. We were back to business as usual, and then we had a huge surge. So getting people in the mental state to gear back up again for that was really tough. Um, I think a lot of the things that we invested in was a lot of psychosocial support in addition to, you know, the providing basics of hotels for people to stay in, food services. We really um, increased the numbers of counseling sessions we had, critical incident stress debriefing, and a lot of um, dialogue between management and staff about what would help them get through the day. Um, but at the end, I think our staff would just tell you um, what they really needed was rest during this last surge. Um, and again, as we go forward, um, being able to prepare for future surges, you know, is one of our top priorities. Yeah, I would add uh, what's what what's needed most is just rest. I mean, we've been at this for for a very long time. I will say though, it's kind of interesting is as as tired as everybody is when we see it when we're rounding in our in our in our hospitals. There is when I go back to the the vaccines that were being administered by our staff. Uh, there's also they feel like they've never been more connected to their purpose, you know. And and one nurse uh, was telling me this weekend, I've never been uh, nobody's told me thank you more in all of my career than this weekend. So I think that also is balancing a little bit of the of the of the fatigue is this energy from really really connecting uh, to to what uh, we've decided that to, that this is what our core to to who we are and why we got in these professions. Um, but I also 
with the clinicians, we did ask them uh, early on, say, we, we asked them, what would make this the best place to care for each other and for our patients? And they said a couple of things that we've heard over the years. You know, at the end of the day, when I'm treating all these patients, I have all this paperwork to do and I have all these notes. Can you help me out with that? So we've inst instituted some initiatives to, to reduce that by 30 percent. Um, they wanted more access to communication in terms of policy. So we set up all of these communication pods. So we're hearing directly from the front line when we're, when we're making policies. And then also we did this uh, well-being index tool. So we send out this survey uh, uh, periodically on nine questions and we, we let the clinician see how their sort of well-being uh, compares to their colleagues uh, and, and over time. And what we've been able to identify is, you know, those those uh, who we need uh, that have that are potentially at risk for personal and, 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 and professional issues. And so we can intervene if they allow us to connect them to the resources in real times that they might need when they're saying, I'm crying uncle, I'm really I'm dealing with with kids at home, I'm dealing with work, I'm exhausted, and I just need help. We're able to kind of certainly they have the avenues to share that with us. But we also have this tool that allows us to, to, to pinpoint that a little bit better. Okay. Kevin, I'll give you the last word on this. It was expected we ran out of time quickly. <laughs> well, David, um, I would tell you that I didn't answer the question at the beginning about what keeps me up at night, but this is the number one thing that keeps me up at night. Um, because without our, our, our teams uh, in our hospitals and our, our faculty, we, we would not be Johns Hopkins Medicine. Uh, and uh, as I've rounded on our, especially COVID units, um, how we're having to respond to this pandemic goes against everything that we were ever taught about patient and family-centered care. And I see the moral distress on our providers' faces because families have not been able to be with their loved ones when they're dying. And, and by the way, our staff have gone to incredible feats of trying to connect families via Facebook, via whatever vehicle, a technology vehicle, vehicle we can, but it's still not the same. And so many people are dying with just our healthcare providers at their bedside. And so uh, we have looked at our own employee health plan and we have seen an increase um, in uh, uh, mental health admissions to our facilities. We've also seen an increase in people who are now uh, being provided anti-anxiety and antidepressants that historically had no mental health diagnosis. So I do worry about this and we are providing many of the same resources that have been identified here, but I, I really wanna make sure we have a healthy workforce on the back end of this pandemic, because we need to take care of each other and get through this together uh, because uh, we need to, to have that workforce so that we can continue to be the organizations that we have served our community for many decades and years. And so uh, I, I really want this to be a continued focus for us in healthcare as we move forward. Well, Kevin, Janice and Jean, thank you. I will tell you that it's, hard because you can't hear the tremendous applause that we have for you right now through Zoom, but I want to thank you all. And I can't think of a better question to end on than to talk about our staff and what we're doing to support them. I appreciate all the time that you've given to us today and appreciate the insightful lessons that we've been able to learn. All the best. Thank you.